Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Office of the Chief Scientist Science Seminar Series. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Vanessa Swarbrick, and I'm a Senior Science Advisor with the OCS and your host for this fall seminar series. On behalf of the entire OCS team, welcome to our Science Seminar Series. As you may have noticed from the notification on the top of your window, we are recording today's seminar. If you would like to ask any questions or have comments, you're welcome to put them in the chat at any time. The chat will not be recorded on the video, so please submit your questions there. Recordings from our previous seminars are available on the Alberta Environment and Protected Areas YouTube page, and new recordings will be posted there in the near future. In the spirit of reconciliation, I respectfully acknowledge that our OCS offices are located on the traditional lands and gathering place for Treaty 6 and 7, as well as Region 3 and 4 of the Métis Nation of Alberta. These lands are home to diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Salto, Anishinaabe, Métis, and Inuit people, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant communities today. Wherever you find yourself today, I encourage you to recognize and acknowledge the relationship that the First Nations, Inuit, Métis people have with the land upon which we all live, work, and learn. In keeping with the tradition of gathering, these science seminars provide an opportunity for us to get together to exchange knowledge on interesting science happening across Alberta in an open and learning sharing environment. The hope is that through our dialogue today, we are all able to improve our awareness and understanding and put this knowledge to practice to support evidence informed decision making wherever that occurs. Today, we'd like to welcome Dr. Jim Davies. Jim received his Doctor of Veterinary Medicine from the University of Saskatchewan in 1996. After four years of clinical practice, he went to the University of Calgary to study the genetic factors associated with biofilm formation by Pseudomonas aeruginosa, obtaining his master's in 2003. Jim joined Inatech Alberta, then called the Alberta Research Council in 2004. He joined as a study director for preclinical toxicology programs and subsequently transitioned to the environmental impacts team. In his roles, he has conducted projects involving toxicology, food safety, environmental microbiology, sensing technologies, conservation biology, and environmental genomics. In 2016, Jim led a project to design and construct in a tech Alberta's aquatic musicosm facility in Vancouver, and then to conduct its very first inaugural experiment the following year. Today, Jim is responsible about the day-to-day -day maintenance and operation of the facility, ensuring that it's available for projects conducted by other researchers. And so today, Jim is going to talk to us about Inatech Alberta's Aquatic Musicosm. And with that, I'm going to pass the floor over to you, Jim. Thanks, first of all, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, as Vanessa mentioned, um, this is our facility. It was built in 2016, and since then, uh, we've been using it to conduct a series of experiments for uh, the demonstration pit lake chip at Cosia. Uh, this fall was the completion of the last of those experiments. Uh, so it's this facility is going to be available for uh, other researchers starting next year. Um, today, I'm going to start by talking a bit about the facility itself, and then I'll move on to uh, some guidance for for those of you who would like to uh, conduct projects here. This is a presentation very much aimed at the uh, researcher or experimentalist um, component of today's audience, but for those of you who have more of a policy leaning and would like to find out about our findings thus far, there are some references uh, at the end of the presentation that you might find uh, useful in that regard. So, mesocosms, uh, what are they? Most commonly cited definition that I'm aware of is the one from Odom, 1984, a bounded and partially enclosed outdoor experiment to bridge the gap between the laboratory and the real world in environmental sciences. When I think about mesocosms, I often uh, think of the image of a teeter-totter or a seesaw. Um, on one side, control, on the other side, realism. And I like the seesaw for two reasons. First, it implies an inverse relationship. Um, as you get more of one, you tend to have less of the other. And it also implies hard limits on exactly how much 
control or how much realism you can have. The teeter totter can only swing so far in either direction. Uh, so th both of those, the, the inverse relationship and the hard limits are something that's worth considering when looking at mesocosm systems. Here are some photos of other mesocosm, mesocosm systems um, from different locations. The point here is just that they come in different shapes and forms and for different purposes. Here at Duke University, there's a, a terrestrial and aquatic component in each of their tanks. Uh, University of Rhode Island, although I don't think their facility is this extensive anymore. Um, these were tall silos essentially used for looking at issues around marine stratification. Down here, two different types of systems from McGill. These are known as limno corrals, so uh, bags of water that are suspended in a larger body of water, and then smallish above ground tanks. What they all have in common is their contents, uh, water, sediment, and biota uh, out of a range of different taxa. The name mesocosm conjures a, a metric of size. Know, micro, meso, macro, and there is a temptation to try and classify them by by volume. That's a bit difficult to do in no small part because the various organizations uh, that purport to to uh, provide best practices can't agree amongst themselves about what size that should be. So rather than have an exact metric in terms of cubic meters or or area, it's probably best to think about size uh, along a spectrum. The smaller your mesocosms, uh, the easier they are to control, the cheaper they are to manufacture and operate, and the easier it is to uh, get replication and within tank, within tank uniformity. The larger your system, the more realistic they tend to be, and also the more complex they are from physical, chemical, and, and biological. Uh, point of view. So here's our facility from overhead. Here you can see a, a half ton Chevy pickup that gives you an idea of scale. As we said, it was built in 2016 and when we built it, our objectives were threefold. Uh, containment, we knew we were going to have oil sands materials in these tanks, so we wanted to make sure we protected our environment. Winter, um, in this part of the world, winter is an important factor in aquatic systems, and it seemed short-sighted to have a facility that couldn't uh, function through the winter and for multiple years at once. And versatility. Uh, we also knew that though we would start with oil sands material, it wouldn't always be that. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we designed a system that could accommodate other types of research um, within its within its bounds. Uh, the design was based largely on best practices from some of those organizations I mentioned previously, and also from interviews with, with experts who had their own facilities. We built this on a fairly compressed timeline. Uh, from the time I was given the okay to spend the money until it had to be in the ground was eight months. Um, and like anything else, there were restrictions on funding. So uh, what we produced here is largely made out of off the shelf parts. Custom made tanks or piping just was not in the cards for this facility. So the heart of the facility is this array of mesocosms. There's 30 of them. Uh, operating volume is usually about 14 cubic meters at 150 centimeters depth. These tanks are made from single pieces of rotomolded linear low density polyethylene. And the reason that's important is because that polymer stretches. It doesn't crack. And this is what allows us to uh, uh, maintain experiments through the winter. The tanks flex as the ice expands and, uh, and comes back to shape when the ice melts. You'll also notice that the tanks are installed in the ground. Uh, that made things more expensive, but it was necessary. And we did that 
for largely thermal reasons. Um, the first is that if we had left these tanks above ground, we would expect largely homogeneous thermal profile with depth. Whereas if we put it in the ground, temperature tends to decrease, uh, at least throughout most of the season, it tends to decrease uh, with depth, making it a more realistic model of a natural system. The other reason, uh, other reasons for putting the tanks in the ground had to do with uh, suppression of day-to-day -day variation in temperature. If you have a hot day or a cold day, that makes some difference in an above ground tank, less so when it's in the ground. And also the insulation allows us to maintain roughly a half meter liquid layer at the bottom of these tanks over the winter. This was this picture was taken, I think, in uh, mid to late February, where you can see our technician uh, drilling through the ice cap to get to the water layer. That water layer allows certain biota to persist over the winter uh, and and continue to to function in subsequent years. These this this dragonfly exuvia uh, we only ever see these in the third year of operation and later, uh, suggesting that the eggs are laid in the first or second year and they don't come out in their winged adult form until the third year. This wouldn't be possible if we didn't have that liquid layer at the bottom. You also notice that the tanks are nested. There's an inner tank and an outer tank, and this goes back to our containment imperative. The actual mesocosm is the inner tank. That's what would hold the uh, oil sands materials or other materials. And the outer tank is there simply as a means of containment. So if the inner tank cracks, uh, the material is stopped at the outer tank. So you might be wondering if if the outer tank is just there for containment, why is it already full of water? Um, that's for a number of reasons. Again, thermal, as I talked about in the previous slide, to get those thermal characteristics, I need conduction from the inner tank to the ground, the surrounding soil. I don't get that if this is an air gap. I may as well put the tanks above ground and take all the shortcomings that come with that if I don't fill this with something that will conduct heat. Also ballast. Um, Unfortunately, we do have times in this site where groundwater is very high. And if this is empty or nearly empty, it will have substantial buoyant forces acting on it and it will float right up out of the ground. If that happens, the surrounding soil subsides underneath. Um, so that means the tank doesn't just sit back down where it used to be, so I have to evacuate the tanks, move them, re-excavate the hole and put them back down. Needless to say, I don't want all that to happen, so I fill this jacket with water so that uh, it, it weighs down the whole system. The other reason for the water is hydrostatic pressure. This is what happens when I don't have enough water in the jacket. Uh, any accumulation of surface water will tend to push in on these flexible, stretchy tanks and cave in the side of it. That's not catastrophic, but it's not good for the tanks either. So by keeping this water jacket fairly high, we push back against accumulations of surface water. The other point I'll make here is this, this ring of steel, this tunnel liner. Um, the tanks are surrounded by this so that the lateral compressive forces of passing vehicles don't don't damage the tanks. Overflow. Uh, I've talked about risks associated with cracking of the tanks. We've never had that happen, but you know we take precautions against that. Similarly, we have to take precautions against the risk of overflow. Um, theoretically, with sufficient rainfall, the material that's inside these tanks could flow over the top and out into the environment. We mitigate that risk two ways. The first is by essentially freeboard. We operate these tanks at about 150 centimeters nominally, and the rim of the tank is, I think, 182 centimeters. So we have 
30 odd centimeters of, of buffer there. The other way we mitigate the risk of overflow is with these overflow tanks. If the water level reaches 165 centimeters, it hits this uh, port and flows by gravity into these overflow tanks, which will receive roughly a thousand liters of uh, water, giving us a little more buffer. All told, between the freeboard, between this water level and the port height, and the volume associated with these tanks, we can absorb roughly 23 centimeters of rainfall before we have to start pumping out tanks and moving it to, to wastewater containment. The daily record for Vegreville is 4.1 centimeters. So we have, you know, five and change days of, of uh, buffer engineered into this system. Shortcoming of the system, these overflow tanks only work when they're not floating. Uh, if the groundwater gets high, as I mentioned before, these empty tanks will float. So we needed some way to address that. And we did that with a two part solution. The first is this culvert. Uh, the culvert, it's open ended and it's simply there to prevent soil subsidence so that when the overflow tanks uh, float, the surrounding soil doesn't subside underneath them. The second part of the solution are electric pumps, submerged electric pumps, which, which sit at the bottom of these stand pipes. Uh, they have sensors attached, which will detect water level. And when it gets high enough, the pump turns on automatically and pumps water through this hose to the pipe, which then drains into a nearby ditch. And this is all powered by uh, by solar power. If we let this system go long enough, it's it can actually reduce reduce um, groundwater levels across the whole facility. OK, uh, back to our overhead view. Uh, I'm going to talk about these structures up here. These are the supply ponds and we use these ponds to propagate aquatic plants. Uh, this square here, also shown here, is the shallow supply pond, and these are the deep supply ponds, which are essentially like mesocosms. The deeps are for submerged aquatic plants, and the shallow is for emergent aquatic plants. The reason we take it upon ourselves to propagate these plants is twofold. The first is availability. When we uh, start an experiment, say in, in late May or early June, it's often difficult to get sufficient numbers of aquatic plants for our experiments from our suppliers. They just don't have that many available early in the season. So we bring plants on site in the preceding year, propagate them ourselves so that they're available when we need them. The other reason has to do with transplant stress. If you well, when we order a plant, the supplier has to uh, harvest it from its otherwise normal environment, package it up, ship it to us, and then we receive it and plop it down in our systems. There is a level of physiologic stress associated with that. Uh, and enough that some of the plants die or at least don't grow very well shortly after they're received. If we just plop them straight into our experiment and they die, well, is that because of transplant stress or is it because of the test material we're working with? By bringing, it, bringing them in the prior year, uh, we can weed out the ones that are going to succumb to that stress and have healthy plants going into our experiments. Roads, you can see this road network. Um, those are there simply to facilitate operations. We can take vehicles up to the size of a hydrovac along these side roads and up to the size of a B train um, on this main road. Hydrovacs we use mostly for cleaning out the tanks and the B trains are for collecting and delivering materials for the experiments. 
potable water. Um, you might imagine that in a hot, dry summer, we will lose quite a bit of water through evaporation. And as we lose water, everything that's in those mesocosms tends to concentrate more and more. We don't really want that concentration, so we have to offset the evaporative losses. Um, and from a theoretical point of view, distilled or deionized water would be optimal. Problem is, it's not practical. Again, in, in a hot, dry summer, I've had to offset something on the order of 200 cubic meters of evaporative loss across the whole array. Getting even 25 or 50 cubic meters of distilled or deionized water is a bit of a problem. I'm not aware of a source nearby or close enough to make that sort of delivery possible. Um, even if I did, I suspect it would be very expensive. Extrapolating from uh, some US sources I found, I might be spending upwards of a quarter million dollars for that much deionized water, and that's just not practical. So we use potable water. We bring it in by truck, and we put it in these big vertical tanks, and we let it sit there until we need it, and it's distributed to the mesocosms by these PVC hoses. Generally, this is fine. What we do notice is a slight increase in fluoride and in some cases hardness. But other than that, um, we really don't notice any changes to the mesocosms associated with this water. Wastewater tanks, um, you can see those here up in the northeast. These are very much like the potable water tanks with a few exceptions. Uh, the first is that they're housed inside a berm, a membrane lined berm. The idea is that when you you finish with your experiment, you you pump out the water to these wastewater tanks. That water is going to contain test materials which are likely to be somewhat noxious. So. We take precautions to prevent any sort of environmental contamination. One of them is this berm. The other one is that these tanks don't have any fittings in them. They don't have a tap at the bottom, which can leak. Rather, water goes in and out through the top of the tank. When you fill these tanks, the uh, tanker comes, you pump out the tanks, it goes to the tanker, and then to deep well injection or whatever the appropriate disposal method is. So that's the, the profile of the facility itself. Um, for the rest of the presentation, I'm just going to talk about sort of general phases of executing a mesocosm study, largely based on our own experience. And I'll, I'll break it into conceptualization, planning operations, and the actual execution of the study. I won't go into analysis and reporting because that's so greatly affected by any one experimental design that I probably can't say anything uh, helpful in a generic sense. Conceptualization, the single most impart, important part of this is to know exactly what question you're asking. What is it you're hoping to learn? That may seem obvious, but it's worth spending some time. Uh, because everything that comes after this step is determined by defining your question. Once you've defined your question, the next uh, point you have to investigate is whether or not mesocosms are necessarily the way you want to, to address that question. Do mesocosms have sufficient uh, realism and control to address your question. So by means of analogy, uh, a mesocosm is to a natural system what a toy airplane is to a 747. You can use a toy airplane to learn about the physics of flight. Uh, what, by changing the center of gravity of, of an aircraft, how does that affect its flight? What about the shape of its wings or the size of its propeller? 
all of that generalized research is applicable to a 747. But what you can't get out of a toy airplane is precise understanding of how much fuel a fully loaded 747 is going to burn in a flight from Los Angeles to Hawaii. There is limits to the model. Similarly with a mesocosm, mesocosms are great at questions like, you know, you have two insecticides, insecticide A and insecticide B. How do they each influence the aquatic invertebrate community in comparison to each other and in comparison to age and composition matched uh, systems uh, within these tanks? That's a great question for a mesocosm. Bad questions for mesocosms would be exactly how many liters of a given insecticide could flow into a marsh before um, you know the invertebrate abundance dropped by fifty percent. That's that's too precise, and we can't we can't give you those sorts of numbers based on a mesocosm study. So important to think about what mesocosms can and can't do in relation to your research question. Also questions around group size and effect size. Uh, how many tanks are you going to need per group, assuming you're doing a design based on groups? Um, some parameters, some physical chemical parameters like temperature or conductance, you don't need many at all. For other uh, variables, say invertebrate community, five or six tanks per group is probably what you want to go with. Um, runtime, how long does your experiment have to run for? Uh, these mesocosms change, they age. Uh, adventitious plants grow spontaneously in these tanks. Uh, the invertebrate community changes, it simplifies over time. So you have to be able to accommodate changes like that um, in your design. Also looking at dependent variables. There is a tendency with these studies to want to just measure everything and sort out all the data after the fact. Uh, I would not advise that approach. Uh, one, you run into the trap of multiple comparisons. You will find statistical differences, but they may or may not be uh, meaningful. And to that point, here's a picture of Carlo Bonferroni. The other issue with measuring everything is just the sheer logistics of it. Here you see um, 60 coolers. This represents uh, what happens when you take water samples for a, fairly large water samples for a particular toxicity assay from all the tanks at a single time point. Um, when this occurred, when we had to take these samples, we wound up having to beg our way into the largest walk-in cooler we had in the building. And then we had to hire hot shots to take these coolers to the lab in Edmonton, which then had to ship it to the lab in Vancouver. And even then they couldn't handle all the samples all at once. Um, you want to think about really how many samples do you really want to deal with logistically, because uh, it can be a problem. Planning the operations. Probably want to start this phase six to nine months before your day of dosing. And I'm breaking this down into configuration, schedule and decommissioning. The configuration just refers to what you have in your mesocosm. And as I mentioned before, Really, that breaks down into sediment, water, and biota. For the sediment, uh, I recommend whatever sediment you choose, you have it in smaller containers. That makes your life much easier when you have to clean these tanks out. Where is the sediment coming from and what are its characteristics? The base water. I suspect in most cases using our local surface water, which we can bring on site by this irrigation pipeline system. That base water comes with its own uh, aquatic organisms, so you don't have to 
uh, grow all those yourself. It just comes uh, straight out of uh, out of the marsh we we harvest this from. But if you don't want to use our local water and you want to use something else, you have to be willing to consider how that's going to get on site uh, and the the expense and organization associated with that. Biota, uh, some of the biota are going to be installed like these plants, uh, emergent plants in these rafts, submerged plants in these socks. Uh, how are you going to arrange them? What amount do you need? And also uh, uh, benthic inocula. What we have done is we go to our local marsh, um, same one where the water comes from, uh, harvest some sediment, um, and inoculate each of the mesocosms with a couple of liters just to to uh, uh, bring in some of the biota needed for the uh, the model system. Scheduling, uh, not a terribly exciting topic, but one that's very important. Uh, I would recommend you schedule the whole study from beginning to end, right from the first day of receiving your materials to the last day of decommissioning. I say that because uh, first you need to know how many people you need, when, uh, and for what jobs, because the front end of these studies can be very uh, labor intensive. Second, you need to anticipate where conflicts are going to be. Uh, weather, trucking, other events will, will occur and they will throw your schedule off. If you've thought about all of this and you know which steps uh, have certain prerequisites or certain consequences, you can adapt to those uh, events more easily than if you're just flying by the seat of your pants. Decommissioning, that's cleaning out the tanks. Um, in the planning stage, what you really have to think about is how are you going to dispose of the materials in these tanks? This is not something to be left to the end of the study. Um, in our cases, we typically had to evacuate these tanks and either transport materials back to the oil sands or take it to deep well injection. That meant we had to obtain trucks, we had to have people, we had to have a schedule, we had to have vac trucks, so like these semi-vacs and hydrovacs. They had to know where they're going, we had to know what the turnaround time was and so forth. Whether your decommissioning phase is that complicated or not largely depends on what you're putting in these tanks. Maybe all you're putting in is a little bit of fertilizer, in which case disposal will be much simpler. Or you're putting in something a lot more contentious, in which case the decommissioning could be a lot harder. So plan all this out six to nine months ahead of time. In fact, if you were to come out and want to do an experiment, I'd insist this be planned out before the experiment could start. OK, uh, now we'll get on to just the execution part. This is the boots on the ground part. Um, and again, I've broken it down into into a series of phases. Usually operations starts the actual execution part starts about two months before your day of dosing. First part is receiving materials. Um, for some experiments, this might be trivially simple. It was not for us. Uh, we receive materials by the tanker load often. Um, so that had certain complications associated with it. One is weather. This is a picture of the road that leads to the mesocosms in, I suspect, late April. And you can see it's completely flooded out. Uh, there is no tanker truck that's going to make it down that road. So we have to accommodate that, that event. We also need equipment to to offload certain materials. So this is something you can expect to have to deal with if you're dealing with materials on an industrial sort of scale. Uh, setting up the mesocosms, establishing your configuration. Uh, really what you're trying to do here is just establish that all the mesocosms have the same, the same components. 
uh, at the same time. This is typically uh, a multi-step sort of process. After you've got your configuration established, you then want to homogenize. Uh, you want to make sure that all of the mesocosms you're using in your experiment are as homogenous as possible from a, a physical, chemical and biotic point of view. The way we do that is by circulating water between tanks uh, driven by a pump, but other facilities use other methods. Then you want to leave your tanks alone. Uh, this is a what we call an establishment period or a maturation period. And you're just attempting to to give the tanks time, give the, the model ecosystems time to establish themselves, to establish food webs and uh, begin to function in a normalish sort of manner. How long should this be? Uh, how long should this period be? It's not well established. There's no hard and fast rules. Uh, generally, these periods are measured in weeks to months. And the longer your experiment is going to be, you probably want a longer establishment period. But again, there's no there's no sort of arithmetic formula I can give you for the minimum time. Down here I've just clipped out the part from the uh, OECD guidance on this talking about maturation time, its purpose and, and uh, why you need one. When you start approaching dosing a few days ahead of time, you're going to want to take some uh, measurements probably from your mesocosms and maybe even from the test material itself. For the mesocosms, sometimes it's helpful to have a pre-dose uh, set of data just to use as, as covariates in your later statistical analysis if you need them. And from the test material, uh, you want to confirm that it is what you think it is, and you may need to homogenize it to make sure that every mesocosm gets the same amount and the same character of test item. Dosing, we've always done dosing as a single event, but other experiments you could have a sort of a trickle dose that that happens over time. Whatever you choose in terms of timing, you want to keep that timing homogenous. Um, if your first tank receives. Receives its material on the 1st of June and the last tank receives it on the 21st of June you're going to have a lot of noise in your data. So you want to minimize that noise by minimizing that that range of dose day. Also volume, uh, we've been using very large volumes of dose material and the problem with that is that there's a dilution effect. If you see a reduction in certain metrics, is it because the dose material had a had an effect on the community or just because it diluted it out by sheer volume? So the minimum volume is preferable uh, when you do your dosing. After dosing, that's your data collection and your sampling. If you're at all interested in the acute effects, you may want to bias your sampling and dosing towards the front end of the study. Those effects will occur, as the name implies, shortly after exposure. Um, water sampling. We have noticed some degree of stratification in the tanks, particularly in the second and third year. So the chemistry can be a little different at the bottom than it is at the top. So uh, uh, an integrated method of water sampling is something you might want to consider. Sediment, if you're taking sediment samples, think about how you're going to get those samples. If you just you know, have a bucket of, of sediment at the bottom and you leave it, you haul it up through the water column. It's going to to release suspended materials all the way up and that those suspended materials are going to get into your water samples if you haven't already taken them. So think about that. Also think about whether you 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 care about the difference between the top of the sediment layer and the bottom, because if you do that will alter how you take your sample. Uh, for biota, two different approaches, uh, 
destructive versus non-destructive measures. If all you're doing is measuring plant height or, or plant biomass, uh, at least for the submerged veg, you can do that the whole study long without really causing uh, any change to the system. Conversely, if you're going to actually harvest some of these plants and look at like root biomass, that means that those plants aren't present for the rest of the study. So think about whether that's something that's going to affect your outcome. For other biota like animal biota, consider your method of collection. These are two different um, sorts of samplers we use for our invertebrate community. One is this sort of funnel trap. The other is this Hester Dendy sampler. They will give us different views on the same community. So we've been actually using both of them in uh, in our characterization of that community. Decommissioning. Cleaning out these tanks is a lot of work. Um, so make sure you have the staff and you have the equipment available. As I mentioned earlier, groundwater can be a challenge and to clean out these tanks, you have to empty them. So that means that when you empty out a tank, you only have a few hours to clean it out before it must be refilled. Um, so that affects your scheduling and how you approach uh, the decommissioning process. Uh, weather plays a factor. Uh, in pre if there's a lot of rain and we have surface water accumulations, I'm probably going to tell you that some of those tanks can't be decommissioned until that surface water goes away. And if it's very cold, this just becomes a terribly miserable process. Um, so best to decommission in September rather than October. This process is also highly dependent on equipment. Here's our pressure washer and our pumps. We need these hydrovacs and semivacs on site. The truth of the matter is your schedule may be as much dictated by the trucking schedule as it is by anything else. So uh, bear that in mind. This page, um, some references to the policy people here. Our reports are listed down here. If these COSIA links are a bit too, uh, too long and complicated, you can always just go to the CCLM website and search under mesocosms and these will all pop up. Best practices documents uh, from different organizations. Uh, you know, mesocosms are not a new thing, so there's a lot of information that can be had here. Um, if you're interested in the facilities themselves, here's a couple of websites um, and here is our uh, our paper to date on this work. Thank you very much, Jim. That's a lot of information and a pretty phenomenal facility. As a quick reminder, if you're not on the mailing list to receive invites for our science seminars and you'd like to be added to it, or if you or your team has work that you'd like to present here at one of these upcoming science seminars, please contact us at the Office of the Chief Scientist. Our email is aep.ocs at gov.ab.ca. And with that, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today, but a big thanks and shout out to Jim Davies here today about all of the information that we've learned at this really cool facility that's um, put together by Anatech. So thank you so much, Jim, for sharing all of your work with us. And for everybody else who tuned in, we'll see you next time.